Uh, we are going to listen to a green woman who came from the um, University of uh, um, Innsbruck, who is a PhD student in informatics. I'll let you start the speech. Okay, thank you to everyone. Uh, I'm Elwin, and today I will uh, give my presentations about bringing wiki projects to the Andes. And first of all, I would like to greet to the Quechua people that are in Peru. So, Imainaya Kashan Kichis, Kunan Kai Paris Lachtapi Tarikushani, Kunan Kai Presentation Tarashani, Imanachting, Kakuna Kaurina Kichispa, Imaina Tachus Nokanchis, Kai Wiki Project Kunata, Pirusuyanchis Manchachi Mushani, Inaka. What I said is yes. Uh, hello to everyone, to the people, uh, Kichwa people in Peru, and I would like to show them what we are working on and how we are doing it. So let's begin. And the title of the project, basically, it's some of the my presentation. It's uh, bringing wiki projects to the Andes because. Um, it's known that uh, Wikipedia, all the Wikimedia projects are mostly based for well-known languages, but in the last years it was focused more to uh, minoritized communities and minoritized languages. So my idea was to bring those projects, make it reality, but in the Andes, basically. Okay. And this is the outlook of my presentation. I will first explain why Wiki Andes and how we could in we are innovating in free knowledge ecosystem. Then also what we have learned so far from this experience and also how we are heading towards Wikimedia 2030. So why Wikimedia, uh, Wiki Andes, we are called as Wiki Andes, but it's a dream to, to become maybe in the future as a Wikimedia Andes. So it would be a, a, a dream, make a reality. So who we are? We are four passionate people that are working on this project, also with many collaborators. And our mission is basically to develop and strengthen 21st century skills for all. And I am Elwin Waman from Peru, Jorge Luis Waman from Peru, Ver Veronica Ramos from Peru as well, and Elena Musetti from Italy. And there are some collaborators like uh, uh, David Lindemann from Basque Country, Valeria Caruso from Italy, and also uh, this project was more or less based on a summer school last year, and this is more or less the continuing of this idea. Yep. Usually we are uh, used to see the map of South America or Latin America or the Andes in general in the right side image on that way, but from a point of view, it's beautiful when you see the picture full of colors full of diversity, and you can express all the communities or communities around South America or the Andes can be shown. But what we are having currently, it's not a fight, but it's an overwhelming or dominant languages that are taking place in, in the Andes. As we can see, for example, the green is Spanish, the lighter green is Portuguese and so on, and there are other other languages. And, uh, diversity is becoming smaller or minoritized. And this is one warning that we are, uh, aim, uh, we are uh, worried about. And we are still doing this because uh, there is a gender gap in the Andes. N even if the statistics shows that, okay, the gender gap in the Andes is um, produced, or as in some reports is shown. For example, in the World Economic Forum, it's shown that uh, among them, Peru, Guyana, and Chile have improved their gender parity scores the most. But what you can see in the picture, this is from my community. So three out of 15 persons, so only three women. So this gender gap still is there. And it, this is one of the reasons that we are aiming this project or this idea, because we, we are aiming to have this gender parity in the future. 
And also, we always call minority languages minority communities, but I think it's minoritized languages, minoritized communities, and we call attention on that because basically we are marginalized. Uh, we are not in the making decision process in regarding the politics, regarding our rights, and also the technology is failing always. It's not arriving where it has to arrive. So we are always, we don't have internet. And in the pandemic, for example, uh, we shown that we couldn't connect the children. They basically um, couldn't go to the school during two years. So how they were teaching them? Uh, by radio. So they were turning. The first grade will listen the radio the first two hours in the morning. And the second grade, the, the three and the fourth hour in the, in the morning by radio. So this is still happening there. And how we, are we surviving during this time? It's basically we chit chat and we use our language and we communicate between each other, but in an informal spaces. So in informal uh, spaces like the municipality, bureaucratic staff, we have to speak Spanish and this is still a, um, a challenge. But this is one of the reasons why we had uh, moving with this project. And also there is a recent education increases, as I mentioned before. Uh, this, uh, our minoritized groups, basically we don't have access to a high quality education. We are also not taking part in the politics or making decisions. And we are basically, the rate of enrollment of indigenous communities or indigenous people is Basically, they are um, dropping out the school because they cannot finish the school because the language and all this impact that it has when you enter to a new community. And this is when everybody speaks Spanish or other language. And then it's hard for, for, for a kid at this age. And also the migration um, is also joined to this program uh, because to this problem, because uh, as you can see in the picture, there is someone trying to teach to uh, elder people, but elder people, they communicate mostly in Quechua. But they are trying to teach them in, in Spanish. So there are these kind of details maybe uh, that we are not aware of in, in, in the Andes that uh, we, should, we should consider when we are planning some ideas, projects, or education itself. Yes, now I come to the second point, how to innovate in free knowledge and how we thought uh, it could be better for, for our community and how we could proceed in this goal. And our goal basically was to, or is democratize contributions based on contributors' needs, abilities, and skills. And what it means is, um, is basically not to teach all, all people or try to force them what they should learn, instead what they could contribute uh, according to their skills. So in this sense, we, are, we, we focus on uh, some specific uh, topics like uh, reading, writing, um, listening, speaking, or showing their culture. So not all of them, for example, we are not used to reading Quechua. This is one thing but how we could learn to read in Quechua, or how we could speak our language or listen to our language in a recording devices. So these kind of uh, things. And maybe the, this is the, um, the project that mainly occupied our time during the last four months. We were planning this uh, reading Wikipedia in the classroom uh, since we think it's important to read our mother tongue material on Wikimedia projects and Wikipedia. And those projects basically are helping us to achieve this goal. And with reading Wikipedia in the classroom, we wanted to give, uh, or give skills to, um, to contributors or to participants or to the Andean communities 
with the skills to access information, how to access information, then how to evaluate this information and how to contribute at the end. And this approach, it's important because we are all in a society or in a digital society where we have a massive information, a massive amount of information, and we sometimes don't know how to assess this information. If it's true, is it complete, is it false, and this kind of thing. And it's important for Indian communities to learn how to do it. And Wikipedia is a wonderful tool for showing this because you can write articles, you can evaluate the quality of them, and you can also contribute and improve the quality of them. And what we did so far in Peru, uh, we basically reached more than 300 uh, teachers there, and we are planning to certify around 50 teachers uh, in this program uh, at the end of 2023. And we also have some uh, two certified trainers that can run this program in Peru, and the implementations are well, it started in Puno, in the region of Puno, but it will uh, basically go through all Peru. And the languages involved in this uh, program are Quechua and Aymara assets, so we are really aware of um, the languages here. And this is one picture that we, uh, of the program uh, of reading Wikipedia in the classroom in Puno. And there we are basically uh, running an uh, on-site program, but also we did online uh, modes also of the program implementations. Uh, the duration is six months, and the topic is Wikipedia mainly, but also many ways of contributing uh, into the Wikimedia movement. In terms of writing in your mother tongue, well, we have Wikisource, Wikipedia, and other related Wikimedia projects. And in Wikisource, for example, um, there are many textbooks if someone wants to learn how to write or basically how to practice or practice writing in Quechua language. Some textbooks exist in Quechua. They can upload it. They can be uploaded in, in a Wikisource and they can transcribe it and learn how is a word written, basically. And in this regard, we also participate in a science class in Quechua in Peru. Uh, it's held every year and we basically provide a training course during one month to participants and they learn basically not only about Wikimedia projects but also in general how to, for example, construct or create new terms in, in Quechua language. So it's an intense training during a month and regarding speaking, we also um, play with a lingua libre, uh, which I think it's a wonderful tool, and it has a it had a big jump since uh, 2019 because uh, I I met uh, lingua libre in Stockholm in the Wikimedia conference, and it was wonderful how what it can um, uh, it could do, and now it's wonderful because it's easier to do it. So that's fantastic. And so speaking our mother tongue on Wikimedia Commons via we, we, uh, Lingua Libre, it's already uh, something that we can plan in to do. But before that, we did some research as well. And the research we did is something that I learned from my mom. Um, she was saying to me, OK, if you want to gather people, catch up people, you cannot just go and say, OK, we should use this tool for, uh, for saving our language. This is not the way. She said, uh, because she worked as a um, teacher in the 90s when Spanish was proposed as the only language to, to be spoken in Peru. So basically, my mom was going to the mountains and teaching uh, to Quechua speakers Spanish. But the Quechua uh, speakers, they didn't go because they don't think it's um, a good thing or they didn't um, want it, basically. And my mom, the idea of my mom was, okay, maybe if I bring also some new knitting clothes styles or 
So she was thinking, okay, maybe we can make some clothes out of alpaca wool and I can teach you also this in instead. And in the meanwhile, we can practice Spanish and we can learn new vocabulary and so on. So my approach was more or less the same idea. Uh, and I didn't want to force the people to come to me or gather them in a group to say, our voice is important. Instead of that, what I did is to run a kitchen program and uh, run this program in the local radio during two months. And it was two days per week and playing Quechua songs, but not only from my town or not only from my region. But it was because Quechua is not a language only from in Peru. It's not only, it's, it's all also in Ecuador, it's also in Bolivia, it's in many regions and it's different sometimes. And you have to use, um, you have to learn how to pronounce these new words. You have to gain more knowledge if you want to um, to, to revital, revitalize the language or if you want to improve the knowledge. So I ran that uh, in the radio and the people were fantastic because they really like it. For example, the Ecuador, Ecuadorian music uh, style, how they play, because also they were learning new words and so on and they were very happy with that. Then uh, for listening again, we have uh, Lingua Libre and Spoken Wikipedia as we talk also about this topic in the morning. And I think it's doing a fantastic job because uh, you can record it easily and you can show it later if you want to listen this language. For example, if you are learning a new word, you can just go to Lingua Libre, search for it, and you can listen how it, this word is pronounced by a Quechua speaker. So this is something that... Uh, we are also planning to do. And regarding showing our culture and knowledge, it's also important because sometimes, okay, in, 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 in my town, for example, um, probably young people, they all have mobile phones, smartphones. However, they only use it for taking pictures and maybe sparing the time there and that's it. But it was an idea to maybe make a contest there and show them how they can save their culture because every year is different. Every day, every year that when they dress, for example, for a carnival time, um, it's a different dress. So it's more modern sometimes, it's changing the colors and the culture is changing. And this is normal in a society, in the cultures as well in general. And so for that, we run also a photography contest in in Nuñoa is my, the, the name of my town, bringing Nuñoa's carnival to Wikipedia. And there, there was a contest for musicians, artisans, and videos. So basically, we, are, we were trying to document in, um, the traditions and culture of uh, Nuñoa, in this case. And it, it ran for a month during March, and the target was basically young people, if they can help us with this. And we got amazing results because in, in this context, we improved the article of our town itself, and we included also uh, the pictures that, we, that were uploaded on, on, on Wikimedia. So, and also, uh, I want to mention uh, the, the, something that is related to the project before, the presentation before, which is uh, how we can unfold our native language and knowledge with Wikibase, and Wikibase basically it's a platform that allows you to uh, basically store knowledge, but not only linguistic knowledge, but knowledge itself. So basically it allows us to create dictionaries, vocabularies, also uh, Wikipedia articles, also you can uh, create uh, advanced content, a nice interface, you can basically customize as you want. and make it user-friendly in order to gather the community. And yeah, so basically uh, the aim of the Quechua base basically is to harmonize the Quechua, but not only the language, because sometimes we are so focused on the language so we can create in dictionaries, uh, encyclopedias, and maybe some web pages with articles. But the point is to gather the community because if there is no community, why we are doing, for example, the Quechua 
Uh, Wikipedia has around nine years, and there was a time, maybe at the beginning, where people were very enthusiastic about the uh, Kicho Wikipedia, but they stopped at some point because they didn't see any reward on contributing to Kicho Wikipedia. So the idea is to gather this community and uh, let them know that Kichwa, um, it's, it's important and anybody can contribute to that. Yep. And this, for example, is one of the results of the Wiki, uh, Kichwa base. In this case, um, we have uh, one million triples or statements in the Kichwa base. And what you could retrieve so far is, for example, a lexem, a lemma, in this case a word, and then senses in different uh, languages like uh, German, Italian, Spanish, and English, of course, and some example where this word or lemma can it, it's used, and also some references to sources where you can read more about these lemmas. And what we have learned so far. So in this part, uh, I, um, as I already said, we set out on a journey to build inclusive, innovative, harmonious, and democratic spaces of contribution for all. And in this part, I don't want to maybe um, take much time. I don't know how much time do I have. OK. Um, so what we did was uh, run a survey in the Quechua community in the region of Puno. And there, uh, during March to June, and we target mainly teachers because we think that uh, they are skilled and they can maybe spread this knowledge among their students. And we had around uh, 118 teachers registered and active participants, 40 teachers, and we run this program basically online and on-site. So what we found out, so this gender gap is still present. So it's 65% uh, against 34. So um, yeah, we have to do something against that. Um, and also, we have um, just a few amount of young teachers involved in this kind of projects or ideas or courses. And mostly from private, uh, public uh, schools, they are joined, not much from private. And the day of preferences where they would like to have this kind of a training source programs, it's during um, Friday and Saturdays. It's a strange because on Saturdays we usually go to the mountains, uh, but <laughs> they put it on Saturdays and Fridays. But um, yeah, l later I will explain you why I think they are doing this. Yes, and so what would, the, what would be the ideal hours for the training programs that we asked about? And they say uh, between 6 to 8 p.m. Okay, now a parenthesis here, uh, because they are doing this course because we ran this a uh, couple of times already. And between 6, six to 8, people are most, mostly having dinner. Okay, and... What they do, and I notice also in, in, in my family, in my sister and people around, that they listen to the course, but they don't interact. So what, for example, they are eating and they are listening to our course. And when we ask something, uh, we cannot ask them to, oh, you can create an account in, in Wikipedia or in Wikimedia in general, but we can just ask small questions. Um, for example, how you can contribute this and give some alternatives, A, B, C. And they can type A, they can type B, they can type C. So we can know if they are learning or not through the process. But we cannot ask them to, to make a big contributions or a, a, a big uh, task. So this was um, funny. And yeah, it, I, I think it also makes sense in, in, in the society, in, in, in the Quechua community. And we also ask about if uh, do you think encyclopedias contain quality information? And they say very likely and extremely likely. So this is quite uh, okay. 
and to what extent and through what means do you access encyclopedias? They access encyclopedias by laptop um, always, but for example, textbooks less or tablets uh, or desktop computers. What resources do you use to plan your lessons? We also put Wikipedia as an option and some of them they use Wikipedia but mostly they use educational websites and we need, uh, uh, we need to look in detail what they answer because it was an, more or less an open uh, text uh, answer so uh, what educational websites they, they look at so this is still uh, it needs some more analysis there and, and also it's interesting because they for example they don't look the past lessons to prepare the, the 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 new lessons basically so this is interesting so there there is a lot of analysis here and of course there is some enthusiast uh, teachers also that they want to use ChatGPT or YouTube for for planning their lessons and what sources of information do you know and to what extent do you consider them to be reliable i think wikipedia is uh, well standing here and but we can see, I just want to point out, for example, the um, TV, it's not really a reliable source. And also um, newspapers. So it's sometimes, sometimes, but not, not really. In Peru, we have a um, political thing that came from the past um, governments that made us not rely on TV or uh, newspaper. Are you familiar with, with training courses? And they mostly they say yes, so they had experience. But as I said, they don't interact much. They, you cannot ask complex tasks to do it. And what motivates them to, to attend these training courses? Basically, they want to get new ideas. And we should bring these new ideas to them. This is a point to do and where do you find professional training opportunities it's funny because they all think that uh, training opportunities they will find it on social networks so on facebook for example so by emails really few and this is the fourth part of my presentation this is how we are moving forward to to, towards Wikimedia 2030. I think this is a common goal that we are aiming in the Wikimedia movement and we wanted to also align to these goals or recommendations, basically. So we propose an innovative space for contributing to the free knowledge ecosystem. We propose courses, uh, workshops adapted to the skills of the contributors, either reading, listening, recording voices, or writing or practicing or taking pictures and we also show ways to engage with minoritized communities we also uh, show how to contribute to increasingly diverse societies so i think it's it's important and some insights that we gain here is uh, language revival is a good investment. It does raise self-esteem and give recognition to minoritized communities. Then people are more likely to engage with society, education, and employment. I think um, if we offer to minoritized communities a high-quality education, they will definitely get a good employ, uh, a good, uh, a good job, basically. So, and it's a continuous challenge. Uh, it's a long process and you cannot get immediate results. It's a long-term result. So step by step. And it took us already uh, five, five months already to get more or less what they want, how they want it. And it's a uh, long-term result. And it's different if, I, for example, I could go just directly to a capital city like Lima. Maybe I can get better results. Maybe I can get contributors. And this is maybe the easiest way. I don't know, but I wanted to focus on the Quechua community because I know them and it's important to show what are the challenges there. And of course, we 
we are proposing uh, new approaches that involves also Wikimedia um, tools or tools that are built on during or inside the Wikimedia movement. And how we are heading towards Wikimedia 2030. Uh, we seek to drive and facilitate innovation that will help us to first the second recommendation, improve user experience. Third, uh, fourth, uh, ensure equity and decision making, uh, skills and leadership development, and innovative in free knowledge. And I want to close with this sentence or statement uh, regarding to contributing 2023. Language revival is gaining more relevancy and needs new approaches. That is why we are here today, uh, aspiring to contribute not only to the present, but above all to what we believe can shape the future of humanity. So thank you, Contribuling, for the opportunity. And thank you to all that are listening to my presentation. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any question in the room? Please. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, Please. Wait. <laughs> yeah. uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. So my question is regarding how you manage dedicating so much time, because I can see based on the quality of your work, um, to make this work. Is it easy, given that you probably have also some other duties in your life? Yeah. Th uh, thank you for, for the question. I think. Uh, uh, I'm a PhD student and sometimes being a PhD student is not hard because you have a lot of work and it's very flexible sometimes, but you need to focus. And this is, um, it comes from an inside uh, idea or dream, I would say, because it started in 2019 in the first uh, Wikimania, well, in the Wikimania 2019 in Estocolm, where um, I wanted I, I had the idea of building a kitchen knowledge graph. So it was because I was, my PhD was focusing on knowledge graphs and I wanted to explore this part of, uh, of science. And I said, maybe I could go to the, to the conference. And yes, they accepted the conference. And since then, I started to imagine how it could be. Because Wikipedia is always, or the Wikimedia projects are far away from, from my town. Before my town, there was no idea to see, okay, what is Wikipedia? You can use it, maybe you can, you are using it, but you are not conscious about that. And nowadays what I do, it's basically uh, to delegate this task, also contribute or gather a community that could run these projects, these ideas by themselves. I'm leading two projects. One is the Kichu base, and the other one is the Wiki Andes, and also doing the PhD and also uh, some other works. But I'm passionate about this, and this is something like uh, that you find as a reward, because my PhD is very uh, industrial focused. It can be done, of course, but what is the the, the reward afterwards? I. I feel like, uh, okay, I need to do something now that I can, now that I have the knowledge. And I think, uh, yeah, and with Sina, we met in the last year in the summer school where we started the Kichu base, and it was a wonderful experience for, for a week. And also I took my uh, holidays, my I take days off from my PhD to go there and do the work. So it is a self-decision to do these kind of things, and I think, um, it has some results, so this is this is good, and also it's changing uh, people to do it. Maybe I hope uh, in the same way to improve and to bring wiki projects to anywhere in the world. I 
Any other question in the room? There's a question in the chat. Uh, how many people work did work full time on the project? Um, we are not full time. Maybe we are only part time, and we're dedicating hours to that. But effective hours. Since uh, January of this year, we set up the team of four people. And I personally went to Peru as well. I took uh, days off for the for that well, months off. Uh, for going there and yes so I personally did the trip and and we are four currently but uh, with Kichwa base uh, we are another three persons and we, we can that we are four but we are not dedicated uh, full time it's just hours maybe uh, I would say 10 hours per week then day but I'm dedicated more than that so <laughs> This is uh, something that I like to do. So I, I really, I'm really passionate about this. So I don't count the hours. Thank you very much, Elwin, for the presentation. Thank you. On, va, on a un, un petit peu d'avance, mais ça tombe bien parce que on va, pour ceux qui sont intéressés par l'atelier de Quechua, on va se déplacer vers la Bulac pour l'atelier. Euh, et vous avez du coup cinq minutes de pause avant la prochaine session.